Hi there, I'm Julia Leith, and I'm the pastor of Covenant Community Church in Vacaville, California. So glad that you could make a margin with us to see what the Lord will do. I have my really dear friend here, Sheila Barker, and she's going to share a little bit about who she is and how she came to be at our church uh, after we take some time with the scripture. I'm going to ask you, uh, just if, if you would, to pull out your phone and uh, pull out your notes, because I'm going to ask you a couple questions or even just grab us a, uh, a piece of paper so you might take some notes, because uh, I have a couple questions that I'd like you to percolate on, uh, not only tonight, but as we go uh, through the rest of the week. Uh, if you've been reading along in the Chronological Bible or you spent any time with us, you know that every week we, we look at what the scripture is for the Chronological Bible. And uh, for that reading for that week. And if you have not been reading along with us, dear ones, this is the time to start. We're just in our very first week of the New Testament, and it is a balm for our soul, right? We love the Old Testament. It gives us a bigger picture of God's uh, faithfulness to his people, even when we're kind of dummies. Uh, but the New Testament is a whole different flavor, and we're really excited to be able to revisit God's word, that we might be rooted in orthodoxy, and that we might be encouraged as we're living out in this uh, in particular season. Uh, I was reading, I read through all of it again this week, uh, from this week today, and just was trying to think about and pray about the things that, um, that God might want me to say to you. And, and typically I pick one verse and we spend a little bit of time in that. But what I was struck with, if you've been reading, is we're reading the first chapter of the, of the Gospels. And then there's a couple different uh, scriptures that we read. And there's so much good, good uh, material really to be encouraged. But I was reminded again of the story of John the Baptist. And so instead of settling in on one text, I'm going to just kind of summarize what we read, that we might be reminded again of God's goodness as he calls and uses an ordinary, average, everyday guy just like you and me uh, to make the path straight for the Lord. And so if you were reading with me, you read in Luke 1 that Zechariah, who is his dad, meets this angel. Now, it's a really big day for Zechariah. He's, he's a priest, and he gets uh, basically picked to be able to go in and burn incense. It's a once-in-a-lifetime privilege. And he gets to go there and, and go into the presence of the Lord in a way that none of his friends or anybody around him would be able to do. It's a huge privilege. And especially, this is a guy who's righteous and faithful. He's married, uh, and, and they have done everything right, but they've really struggled with uh, this desire to have kids and not being able to have kids. And, and we certainly know stories with our, or maybe you've lived through that story. And so here is this man who wants children more than anything. And and everyone has kind of reasons and opinions about why he and his wife have not been blessed that way. And so here he is, this man of faith who's going into the presence of the Lord in a really specific, tangible way. And he's taking this time to pray. And, you know, maybe he's praying for his life personally. Maybe he's praying uh, even still at his late age and his wife's late age for this child that they'd hope for and yearn for. Uh, but likely he's praying for the country that he loves and for this long awaited Messiah. And, and so here he is in this moment praying and he meets an angel. And you got to imagine he's surprised. And the angel is, startles him and says, Your prayer has been heard. You and your wife, Elizabeth, will bear a son and you should name him John. So here's where we hear about and meet the very first time this character, John, who is such an important character. And, and it's, it's important, and you see this in Scripture, that there are specific people, not a guy, but a specific family at a specific time that people would say, no, this is in fact a promise of God's faithfulness, even in the midst of kind of the busyness and the craziness. And what does the angel say about John? He says, he will be a joy and delight. It's right out of number six that he's consecrated to God. 
Many will rejoice, and he will be great in the sight of the Lord. And that's truly because of the grace of God, not because of him. It says he will be filled with the Holy Spirit before his birth. And there's a, a little bit more about that later in the text, but it is this reminder again that God is infusing him and filling him with his presence before he's even born. And it says, he will bring back many people to the Lord. It's in the same way as the prophet, the great prophet Elijah, in spirit and in power. You learn all about that in Malachi 4, 5, and 6. And so here's our little first entry into this story of John in the book of, of Luke. And then in the book of Mark, Mark 1 there is this prophecy. And what's so great about Mark is that it goes back even before, even before we hear the story of Zechariah, even before we hear the story of John. Mark 1 goes back to the prophecy that we know from Isaiah 40. It's, the prophet says, I will send my messenger ahead of you and he will prepare your way. And the messenger, it's we, we hear that and we think, oh yeah, that's true. But it's the first prophetic voice in 300 years. And can, can you imagine this, this promise in this prophecy? There's been no prophetic voice in 300 years. And what will the voice say? The voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight the paths for him. And he does just that. If you read ahead in Luke to Luke 3, it says he preached the baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. Now remember, John lives in the desert since his youth. He's kind of a quirky dude. Uh, we'll hear about that a little bit more later. But he lives out in the desert, and yet God's call to him is clear. He's called to a different life. And he preaches this baptism of repentance. Now, repentance is not just feeling bad and kind of going, oh, darn, I dropped the ball. I made mistakes. I sinned in the sight of the Lord. Repentance isn't just feeling. This baptism of repentance is feeling accompanied with action. It's a changed life, a changed behavior. And those actions, by the grace of the Holy Spirit, by the mercy of our Lord, those actions lead to freedom. And so you think about that and reflect on this preaching the baptism of repentance. I wonder for you and for me, are there areas in your life right now that if John was standing before you trying to make the path straight for the Lord, would he be calling you to repentance, not just to feeling bad, but to a changed behavior? And that change behavior is where we find the freedom. So my question for you, which I want you to write down and reflect on it later today and for the rest of the week, are there areas in, the, in your life right now that John would be calling you to repent? To turn from your actions and have a turned behavior which leads to freedom. And, and then the text continues and we read a little bit in the book of John. And John's testimonies, as he's doing this, remember the Jewish leaders, the, the, uh, the leaders of the time come to him and say, who are you? And they start to ask him all these questions. Are you the Messiah? But John is very clear about why he's there. He says, they say, what do you say about yourself? Who are you? And, and that is the interesting question, isn't it? Who are you? I mean, I've talked about this as such an important part of our life of faith. If someone professionally says, who are you? I say, I'm Julia Leaf. I'm the pastor of Covenant Community Church in Vacaville, California. You've heard me say that a hundred times. If someone in the family at a family reunion says, who are you? I'd say, I'm Charlie Brown's daughter and Terry Sue's daughter and Sal Salvador Armando's daughter. I'd say who my family ties were. I'm the twin sister of Eric. I'd talk about where I grew up. You know, there's all kinds of indicators and kind of things that we hang our hats on. Who do we say we are? For him, as he's asking those questions and he's being asked those questions, people would say, I'm a Jew, I'm a Gentile, I'm a pagan. I come from this particular region in my part of the world. I, I'm from this particular family line. 
And I'm always hoping that when people ask us who we are, that we would say what? I'm a sinner in need of a savior and I'm the beloved of Jesus Christ. So when they ask him, who do you say you are? We must be clear, who do you say you are? That's the second question. If someone says to you, who do you say you are? What are the indicators? What are the identifiers that, that you would put before them? And is it in fact that we are sinners in need of a savior and we are the beloveds of Jesus Christ? But he answers very clearly. I am the voice of the one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. He's not teaching something new. He's not coming up with some new theology or trying to uh, instruct them in some different way. He is the voice piece of God. He is, in fact, fulfilling prophecy, which we heard about in Isaiah 40. He's doing exactly what he's supposed to be doing. He says, make straight the way. And that is really making the road passable for the king. This is who he says he is. And then in Matthew 3, Jesus comes to Galilee. We heard, we, if you've been reading, you read that. That Jesus comes to Galilee and he says, hey, you need to baptize me. And John says, well, I'm not going to baptize you. I should be baptized by you. But there is this moment, this sweet moment between John the Baptist who makes the path straight. He's the voice calling this baptism of repentance. When he baptizes Jesus, Jesus is submerged underwater. He comes back up in that moment. The heavens open. The spirit of God descends like a dove and alights on him. And the voice of heaven from heaven, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased of all the people that Jesus could be baptized by. He goes to his cousin, John the Baptist, who is proclaiming the word that God has given him. Make, make the path straight. Repent. So there's so much more about John the Baptist, but what I love about this first week is we start to dream and think about and be reminded again of the richness of God's word. As we see God's faithfulness so long before John was even born. So long before his parents were even born. And that is an encouragement to you and to me. Here's my questions for you. My third and fourth and fifth question. I'd like you to reflect on this. What has God created you specifically to do? What has God created you specifically to do? And, and are you doing it? And if not, how come? So what has God created you specifically to do? Are you doing it? And if not, how come? And the next big question is, are you in your own life, in your words and deeds, making the path straight for the Lord? Are you in your own lives, in word and in deed, written on Facebook, as well as written down, and the, the speaking words that you're saying and the ways that you live your life, are you making the ways straight, the path straight for the Lord? And if not, why not? What I'm realizing more and more is that God is at work in ways that I don't even understand and perhaps you don't even understand. And while we may come up with things that surprise us, God has been nudging us and created us to step out in faith. We have to be willing to submit ourselves and willing to live into the life that God has created us for, is calling us to, and is using us to make a kingdom impact. And I promise you, dear ones, if you do that, you'll never regret it. Won't you pray with me?
God, we're grateful for your mercy and the ways that you show yourself to us. We pray that you would use the story of John the Baptist to encourage us, to challenge us, to motivate us to step out in faith. And as we have the opportunity to make a margin, we pray that you would speak into it. I'm so grateful for my friend Sheila and for her willingness to be here to share. And I pray that you bless her as she does that. And we pray with confidence in the powerful and mighty and holy name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen. amen. So I, I've got to tell you, I'm loving Wednesday nights because one, we have just got fantastic people in our church. And every time I spend time with our people, I'm like, oh, this is one of my favorite people. And then, oh, this is one of my favorite people. The problem is that they really are my favorite people. And <laughs> Sheila Barker is the real deal. I have laughed so much with Sheila. I mean, I remember the first time we hung out and I was like, we're going to be friends. She is so authentic and so loving and so generous. You can call her, as I have been, 12 minutes before you need to leave for the airport because you <laughs> realize that you didn't plan accordingly and go, hey, what are you doing? Could you come and give me a ride like right now? She'll drop everything for you. She is she is so generous and gracious and kind. And what I like about Sheila, one of the things I really like about Sheila is that she is always up for any great adventure. So we went to Israel together with our church group and just, it, I was so blessed by every minute that I spent with her. And I, I'm just excited for you to get to know her and hear a little bit about her. So Sheila, why don't you introduce yourself and tell a little bit about yourself. Well, I um, grew up in a small farm town in uh, Minnesota called Minnesota Lake. And yes, it does have a lake in the, in the town because many people go ask me that. So um, it was only a town of like eight, 900 people. So everybody knew everybody. Um, and um, my mom, at first I grew up on the farm um, it was passed down from when my dad's um, parents, his grandfather, um, came over from Germany and uh, they settled there and, and farmed. And then he was the only boy in the family, so it was kind of passed, it was expected, let's say that, that he, he farm, which he was not a farmer. So he worked outside and my grandfather and my oldest brother pretty much ran the farm. Um, my mom worked um, on the farm, and we, I grew up on there until I went into sixth grade, and then we moved to town. So I always tell everybody I kind of had the best of two mm -hmm. worlds. I had, you know, the farm experience, and it was kind of a fun farm. We had a couple goats, a couple cows, um, you know, dogs, cats, many chickens, which is another story, those I wasn't so fond of. <laughs> Um, and then I moved into town, so actually, um, when I got into high school, I didn't miss anything because I lived on the farm and had to get into town. So I kind of had the best of both worlds. Um, I grew up in a, a United Church of Christ there and um, went to church from basically the time I was born. That's just what you did. It was... It, it just never was a thought that you didn't go to church on Sunday. But I also grew up, because um, I am 71, just turned 71, that back in those that era, there were no stores open. There were no malls open. There was nothing. And, and so uh, Sunday was truly a family day where you, you went to church and then you did family things. I mean, you might play with your friends or your neighbors, but it truly was a family day. You weren't out doing sports and stuff like that that just was not it and um, yeah I uh, until I went away to nursing school you know I was active and we had confirmation class for two years on Saturdays and um, that was just you didn't question it I mean maybe it was the generation we were in it was just that's your brothers did it, you did it, it was just expected, and um, never crossed my mind mm -hmm. that, you, 
you wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually I, I got married and um, he was in the service and so brought me to California and um, um, then we went back and that was in Southern California and we moved a couple of times and eventually when I did get to uh, to Vacaville, um, our realtor um, asked what religion we were. She actually was Mormon, but um, she said, my daughter goes to the Presbyterian Church um, and they have a great youth group mm -hmm. and so if your daughters would like to go, she'd love to take mm -hmm. them and that's kind of how we started over at the other community church, mm -hmm. the Presbyterian Church, and they really um, liked it, got involved, so then we just kind of started going and um, joined that when uh, Dave Moat was there. Mm -hmm. And then they broke off and started having this church, but I, on the south side, because it had just kind of grown too big, mm -hmm. and, and uh, but I didn't go. There was still that part of me that just um, grew up with the old, I, I just needed to worship in a, in a church. And not that we, we don't want to say a church is a building, but when you grow up with that, you just kind of have that persona that, you know, they're going to meet in a community center. Our right, first they met in a gym over at um, the school. And, then, and so I just wasn't ready to make that transition. And then when I was going through a divorce and then Dave Moat um, left, I kind of decided maybe God was trying to tell me it's time for you to make a change. Go to the south side where we live on the south side of town. And um, and then I've been here ever since. Because we're, a, for those of you who don't know, we're a church plant from Community Presbyterian yes. Church. And so um, they're a lovely, faithful, wonderful congregation. And this church was a little bit more... Uh, it was a church plant because of the geography, and so yeah, and we got some. We kind of share a little with people, yeah. And then, how long have you been at this church? Oh lordy, um, since they were in the community center. Oh, before oh, I yeah. uh, over at uh, Callison, I uh -huh. think um, I started when they were there, and then moved over. So Megan was a a senior in high school um, when we moved over. Chris was. I mean, he's turning 31 in November, and I, ugh, and, um, and he was, what, three years old, so yeah. years, I don't remember what year it was, yeah, long come, yeah. years, mm -hmm. yeah. So you've got the three kids who I you have love. three children who You've I got love. your very sweet dog, who's the cutest dog. Yes, my little Rosie. Definitely the top five cuter, <laughs> cutest. She's a little beggar. I give her everything she wants, right, yes. Rosie? Yes, Rosie. Uh, sports teams you happen to be a fanatic about? Um, well, of course, I'm a true Minnesotan, so, you know, the Vikings and, mm -hmm. um, and, um, and even the Timberwolves, even though the Timberwolves are, <laughs> are terrible, I just kind of stick with you them. You are and a good, godly woman. They are gonna, <laughs> one, they're going to break through. And then it was so funny, the twins are kind of, you know, they've won a pennant and they have been to the playoffs many times. And this year, in the short season, they've been doing so well. But I kind of got a lot, gotten out of watching baseball just because it costs a lot of money to see the Twins because you have to buy all these separate packages, you know. <laughs> and uh, But my son has it, and so he hooked me up through Apple TV to watch them. And it's so funny. They won their division this year. They've never lost two games oh. in a row. They have just a tremendous winning record at home. And the first two games they played at home, and they lost them both and were out. And I'm oh. like, what in the world? <laughs> <laughs> and, and what do you do for the church? What do you do at the church? Um, I have been a deacon mm -hmm. for... Um, for seven years, it'll mm -hmm. be coming up, and then I'll be off this uh, in January. I'll be officially off after eight years, mm -hmm. and so different committees on, through the deacons I've done, and I, um, you know, help with taking meals to people. Mm -hmm. um, right now, I'm helping with births and baptisms, taking gifts. We've had five new babies, three, five, yeah, five, five new think, babies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
and just within the last, well, I would say month, I suppose, is maybe not even a month, but, and so we deliver a gift for the baby, and um, I've helped with funerals and just, you know, any, anywhere they need, and right now, um, I'm helping with Meals on Wheels mm -hmm. on Friday, mm -hmm. and Dixie Sperry and I do that, oh, and, I love Dixie. and it's, been really fun mm -hmm. because I'm a retired nurse and I don't necessarily really miss that at all. Mm -hmm. I miss my people, but I have noticed that these people that I deliver meals to have become my people. And one lady wasn't there one day and the neighbor said she wanted you to leave the meal. She's in the hospital. She had a stroke. And so I'm like, smile for me. I want to make sure mm -hmm. you're you know, smiling mm -hmm. okay, and mm -hmm. and uh, so it's just, you know, it's just, um, it's a pleasure. Mm -hmm. It's it, And it also, through this whole COVID process, I think we kind of get feeling sorry for ourselves, mm -hmm. and um, it's a way to give back, and it's a way to realize that our lives aren't so bad, even mm -hmm. though we mm -hmm. do have our own issues sometimes. So the thing that is so encouraging to me is I hear these, always hear the stories, and as I see Sheila live out her life, is that Sheila has spent her whole life in the service industry uh, as a nurse, so yeah. she's in the serving profession, and she's been a deacon for near eight years, where she's always willing to just do whatever she can do to bless someone, to be the hands and feet of the Lord in people's midst. Uh, she didn't tell you, we, we used to, before COVID, we um, used to serve the homeless once a month, and she oh, makes yes. this, I'm, I am telling you, killer, killer chicken casserole with this... Um, poppy seed chicken. The poppy, the poppy seed chicken. chicken. <laughs> It'll change your life. Jesus, and then the poppy seed chicken. No joke. But she just, she, and it's kind of it, what you said at the beginning, that you said, we just didn't think about it. It's just what we do. A and that's, that is an example of... Sheila living out the life that God created her to live. She's a loving person. You don't think about it. You just do it because that's what good loving people do. And, and I just, um, I'm encouraged by the way she blesses people and laughs through life and is just willing to do anything for anybody. And so I hope that if you're um, part of our church family and you don't know she Sheila, that you'll take the time to get to know her more because she is truly a delight. And if you're uh, not part of our church family, but you're thinking about coming uh, to when we, you know, back on, back to campus, I hope that you'll see her because she will surely uh, greet you. She's super friendly. And that you'll know that you're welcome. Uh, I pray that you'll take some time this week to be reflecting on the questions that I asked, as I'll be doing, and and that you'll worship with us either on campus or live stream on Sundays at 9.30. And then we'll be back here uh, in person or live stream on Wednesday nights as we make a margin for the Lord. We're so glad that you could take a moment to be with us. And we pray for God's good mercies for you. Have a great week. Bye-bye now.